For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Andrea Zinn, and I'm Assistant Professor of History and Director of the Jewish Studies Program here at Elon University. And since the beginning of this academic year, actually, I had the pleasure of collaborating with my colleagues of Jewish studies and Jewish life, in particular Ilan Hillel, as well as a group of students here from our university to develop a special program for the day we're uh, celebrating today. Celebrating might be the wrong word, but that we're, uh, as a community, uh, addressing, it's Yom HaShoah. Yom HaShoah is the, the day of remembrance of the Holocaust and heroism, which falls in this year on this Thursday, April the 12th. Although the date was established by the Israeli government in 1953 as a day for the citizens of Israel to remember those murdered during the Holocaust, it has become a day of co commemorated by Jewish communities and individuals worldwide. Outside of Israel, a wide range of commemorative events take place. These include, just to give you an idea, services, prayers in synagogues, educational programs in schools or community groups, showings of films about the Holocaust, and the planting of trees or flowers. It is also common, as we did this morning, to light memorial candles and to recite the Kaddish, a prayer for people who died and to read aloud the names of victims of the Holocaust. The greatest catastrophe to befall the Jewish people in its long history occurred between 1933 and 1945. Due to the actions of the Nazis and their accomplices across Europe, Jews were robbed of their rights, dispossessed of their property, and slaughtered without pity. At the end of World War II, at least six million were dead. Jewish communities across Europe were shattered. Before the Nazis take over of power in 1933, Europe had been a vibrant and mature Jewish culture. By 1945, most European Jews, two out of three, had been killed. Many of those who survived were determined to leave Europe and start new lives, many of them aiming to either move to the newly founded State of Israel or the United States. After the Second World War, 90% of the Holocaust survivors were between 16 and 45 years old. Today, the youngest survivors who were born in the last phase of the war are over age 70. In fact, it is assumed that at this point, fewer than 100,000 Jews who were in camps, ghettos, and in hiding under Nazi occupation are still alive. We're very grateful that two of them, Shelley Wiener and Rachel Kishnerman, accepted our invitation to share their story with the Elon community tonight. Shelley and Rachel were both born in the city of Rivne, then in Poland, today in Ukraine. Before the Germans invaded Poland on September the 1st in 1939, Rivne had a population of 60,000, of which there were approximately 24,000 Jews. When World War II erupted, the Soviet Union occupied the area in which Shelley, then four, and Rachel, then five, lived and drafted Shelley's father into its army. Rachel lost her father in the first wave of killings that left the girls and their mothers. Two years later, when the Germans invaded the Soviet Union, and thus also the city of Rivne, they intended to murder every Jew they could find. How Shelley and Rachel survived the massacre during the Nazi occupation more than seven decades ago is the story that they tell in the Centropa documentary, Return to Rivne, which was completed not long after they visited Rivne for the first time with, with photographer and filmmaker Edward Sotora in 2013. Tonight, we have the special opportunity to watch this approximately just over 20 minute documentary 
that includes many old photographs and exquisite custom-made drawings by artist Emma Flick, together with them. The screening will be followed by a conversation that will last about 30 minutes before we open the floor for questions from all of you. Betsy Pollock, who's director of Jewish Life here at Elon, will moderate that part of this program. At this point, I would like to remind everyone to please silence their cell phones. And we'll end with expressing my profound thanks to all co-organizers and co-sponsors who helped make this event possible. That is the Department of History and Geography, Jewish Studies and Elon Hillel, the Elon Center for the Study of Religion, Culture and Society, and also the Dean of Elon College, the College of Arts and Sciences. I would also like to invite you, while we're getting ready to uh, start with the documentary, to move further up, because when we have the conversation and also time for questions, uh, you will have a much uh, more meaningful connection to our speakers who will be here on the podium. And now before we begin with the screening of Return to Rivne, please join me in welcoming our guests who will join the podium after we finish the screening by giving a first round of applause for them. To Shelley Wiener and Rachel Kishnamer, thank you. I just want to reintroduce you both, as you saw in the film. And we're so honored to have you both here, as we talked about. And we feel so lucky because we had got to have a wonderful conversation with you before we came over um, to Whitley. But this, and tonight you're Rachel, right? I mean, in the film you're Raya, but you're Rachel. Yes. Rachel, and this is Shelley, and I'm Betsy. And you know, every time I watch that, I've watched the film now more than once, and every time I hear, I see different things and notice different things. And your story is so. Um, you should talk into the microphone because... I should, what? I should use the microphone? You can't... I mean, um, <laughs> it's that kind of intuition that, got, that made a big difference in your life, I think, is a big, big theme. So I want to back up to the childhood you talked about before the war and ask you, it, it seemed like the childhood you talked about was a happy, normal childhood, maybe a different time, but maybe not so different than the childhood that lots of people here have experienced. But, but can, you, can you tell us more about it? You, you paint, painted this beautiful picture, but tell us more about what it was like. Well, I was the first girl born in my grandfather's family, and he lived right near us. And I was terribly spoiled. You danced on the table? I danced on the table. I kicked the dishes. I, I did, I, now when I think about it, you know. And my, my father's brothers would take me on their horses and we'd ride around. And uh, I was just very spoiled. That's all I remember uh, from that time, that I could do just about anything I wanted. <laughs> It was a happy time. <laughs> and I lived in a little village with my okay. with my parents, and uh, uh, it was a happy childhood. You know, no no trouble, no worries, not. You know how children, little children are. And I had friends in, in, in that village. Uh, I mean, neighbors. And as you saw in the film, uh, we lived uh, not far from the woods. And when summer would come, uh, a lot of gypsies would come to the woods. And of course, they have a lot of children. And I was playing with the children. They would come to my house. Um, it was a happy childhood. So you both were raised Jewish, is, is that right? Yes. Our families were uh, observant, but not ultra, ultra. Orthodox. They were more modern, modern Orthodox. Um. I don't know about my parents. 
at the village we lived, there was no synagogue, but there was another synagogue in a synagogue in another village. So I guess they did go there on weekends, on Saturday, Fridays or Saturdays. Well, but I don't remember being in in there. I myself, well, no. I can but in and tell you that when your mother came to the United States and we went to synagogue, she knew the prayers and she knew the Hebrew songs. So she must have been educated as a child. Well, yeah, before, before uh, when she was a young girl, uh, she, she went to a Jewish school, a cheder, I think it was called, and of course she was educated uh, Jewishly. Um, my mother always told me that her father, which is my grandfather, was a rabbi. Um, even though he didn't practice, he didn't have a congregation, but he was trained as a rabbi. So that's all I know. And what, was your, what were your towns like? Did you have a lot of friends? Were your families a part of the towns you lived in? Were, it was, well, just to paint a picture of what it was like to live in the towns where you grew up before you went into hiding. Well, um, we had a lot of family and they were always around us. Large family. Uh, my mother came from a family of seven. My father had seven brothers. Um, there was, you know, neighbors. Cousins. Cousins. <laughs> a cousin. Cousins, right. So um, our town was... Um, had a, a very large Jewish population of about 25,000. And I've, I've heard different numbers, but I think the total population may have been 100,000, 80,000, something like that. So we were, we were kind of integrated into the town because my grandfather's family goes back to the 1600s in, in that area. So you had lots of friends who were Jewish and not Jewish, and it, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So then, so you have this happy childhood. You both have these happy childhoods, and then suddenly, you're playing still, just like you used to. But now your mothers are telling you to look out for the brown shirts, and then you you see your father beaten right in front of you, and suddenly things are dramatically changed for you. Yeah. Do you want to say something, Rachel? Yeah, it, it was. It, it was the scariest moment of my life at that time. I really didn't understand what's going on around. Um, you know, being a child, you don't understand the the scope of of what, what's happening. But when the Germans beat my father. That was very, very scary. I, I was afraid that they will kill him, and um, you could imagine how uh, it was. I cried and, and, and whatnot, so. Wait, you know, my memory was different because when they were beating my uncle, and all I remember is that they took him away. I did not think that he survived. I thought that he was dead until we met up again and Raya told me what happened. Yeah, two, two childhoods shared with very different understandings and memories. And, you know, and it's important to remember that you were five. Oh, well, were she, think, she thinks he, he was taken away. I think he, he was left after the beating at the, in the house. So. <laughs> so then, and then the reason you went into hiding was, well, many reasons, but one was, I think the event that precipitated was a massacre. A, a massacre. Right. They and, were, they had informed the Jews in our town to get ready to be relocated. But like Raya said, her mother had a premonition and my mother 
and I guess grandfather did too. And uh, I'm going to read you a um, eyewitness account as to what happened during that massacre. On November 5th and 6th, 1941, notices were distributed that persons of Jewish nationality were required to appear the next day at 6 o'clock in the morning on Castellana Square on Grubnik for evacuation from town. Before November 6th, rumors had circulated around town that we were all to be deported somewhere. No one even had the thought that they were assembling us to be shot. On November 6th and 7th, our entire family, father, mother, sister, brother, uncle, aunt, walked to Castellana Square on Grubney. A wet snow was falling. A piercing wind was blowing. It was still dark but thousands of people walked toward the square from all directions through the storm and bad weather. No one but Jews were, us, were on the street. Since the order of the town chief had created such a situation, men walked with bundles on their shoulders. The Germans had permitted us to take with us our valuables and a supply of food. Women walked carrying children in their arms. Old folks came too. The healthy carried the sick in their arms. Toward 10 o'clock in the morning, we finally reached the square. Even before arriving at the square, people began to, something, to sense something bad. All adjacent blocks had been sealed off by the SS and the police. It was impossible to turn around and go back. The police would not have permitted it. And people were locked into a dense, dense mass that there was no room even to move, let alone to walk against the flow. Pushed from behind and not seeing, the police pressed us into some sort of madness. Sometime between noon and one o'clock, the square was so packed with people, there was no more room. A German climbed on a hillock and told the assembled crowd through a megaphone that they must leave here in a heap on the square everything they had brought with them, bundles, packages, suitcases, etc. A half hour later, they had grown several mounds of such bundles. Next, they led us all along two routes to the village of Sosanki, located some two to three kilometer walk from town. Now three chains of police and SS escorted us. There was no possibility of escape. As we approached Sosanki, we understood that we were walking to our death. Before my eyes, there appeared a nightmare scene, one from which my blood still freezes, even now, many years later. There was a ditch about 100 meters long. Logs had been thrown across the pit. On the logs stood 10 to 20 people, arranged with their back of their heads facing us. There was a long volley from tummy guns, and people fell into the pit like mowed ears of corn. Not far from the ditch were several more pits. Everyone was forced to undress stark naked and to walk to the edge of the pit, men and women separately. Every executioner practiced his own special type of murder. Some lined their victims up along the edge of the pit, facing forward, and the Germans by turn shot each one in the back of the head. Others, their victims on their knees in front of the pit, 
while others forced their victims to run toward the pit and shot them as they approached the edge, and so on. Some threw young children alive in the pits, while others hurled them in the air and shot them in flight. All of this was accompanied by the deathly groan and screams of the dying. As night fell, naked and at the limit of exhaustion from which I had seen, I lost consciousness. I was saved that night by some sort of miracle. I crawled between the lines of police and reached my friends who lived at the edge of town. My entire family and all my relatives had been shot together with 17,500 Jews of Ravna. I do not know the name of, of the executioners. They were SS men, Gestapo, Ukrainian police. The shooting went on for almost three days. And our entire family was killed in that massacre, except for Ryan, me, and our mothers. And it was, it was intuition that caused your mothers to hide you. Right? It was pure intuition, right? It was a feeling that they had. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Which, and then later on, you had the intuition when you, were, when you had to change locations, to, to, to change locations and to run out the back and not to... Not to let them... Uh, yeah, not to come down quietly and let them just take right, us away. Right. But to run, you knew the back door was, the back fence was yes. an option. Yeah. Yes. So you're these little girls, you're four and five years old, and you go into hiding. That must have been very scary because for you, your life was very different. You didn't know at the point, this point, I imagine, about this massacre. How did your mothers explain, or do you remember them explaining anything to you or trying to help you understand why your lives had changed? Anything like that? No. No. Or no. how did you make sense they, of it? They didn't try to... They didn't try to tell us anything. No. They just told us to be quiet, that we couldn't speak loudly. They told us to be, behave, not to make any noise, not to move around. That's and right. we somehow, I think it was instinct that made us behave as well as we did. Because I think the, the will to live is strong in all humans. Even, even in little children. Little and children. Um, you, get, you get to understand the danger. You, you, you have whatever feeling <laughs> yeah. um, that it's dangerous and you, you want to be safe. You want to be safe. Yeah. Right. And you mentioned in the film the the hot and the cold, and the feeling of the hot, and that that was what you remembered most, and, the, and then the wanting to watch the um, kittens and play uh, outside, and the mice play. But do you, are there any memories, other memories that you have about hiding? Do you have a sense of what, your, uh, what a day was like in, in hiding? Just sitting there, not be able to move around, and... and uh, Chipping on straw, that's yeah. the most I remember. And one, one little story. Um, our house was not that far from that farmer's house where we were hiding. And we did have a cat uh, before the war. And of course, um, when we went into hiding, uh, we didn't know what happened to the cat. He, he, he was probably homeless. But that cat came over to the um, place where, where we were hiding, and he was meowing there, standing at the bottom of the ladder. We were in the attic, and the cat somehow had the feeling that we were there. It was unbelievable that a cat could, <laughs> could come and find us. And uh, as a matter of fact, um, the neighbors knew it's our cat. And 
the people that he does, they were afraid that what if somebody sees that yeah, and, and that. find out that something is, is there, yeah. somebody is, is there. Um, you know, when we back, went back in 2013, uh, the, the farmer's grandson told us that, you know, I, I said that how difficult it was for Christians to, to hide Jews because the neighbors were always looking to see what was going on. And the Germans would make a um, sweep through the village every so often. And he said anybody who turned a, a Jew in would get a kilo of sugar, which was like a, lot. Like a pound and a half of sugar. In war, that's a lot. Well, in for human time. life, I... Right. <laughs> right. So what do you, that was my next question is, what do you think, you, you mentioned in the film that, you, that they had such strength and such bravery, and who knows how anyone would act in this situation, you never really know. But, do you, but is there a sense of what it was about them or why it was that they risked their lives to save you? Well, I would say um, when, when we lived in, uh, came to live in that vi village, my, my mother, my father, they were young people, just married maybe, um, they didn't have a place to live. So uh, these neighbors uh, let them stay, my, let my parents stay in their house. And as far as I know, this is what my mother always told me, that she was very helpful uh, to, to the lady of the house. She, they have livestock and, and fields and all that. And my mother was helping her any way she could because they have ch little children and, and so on and so forth. So what I think, it wasn't as much um, the uh, the man of that uh, household, but the woman that was insistent in hiding us because she remembered how much my mother was helping her, and um, they kind of had a very good relationship. So that's my opinion, that she was uh, essential to, to our hiding. I would say if it would be to that m man, he probably wouldn't let us hide there. But, but Natalia... It was the woman. I don't know. Uh, I went back again in 2015 had dinner with uh, uh, this grandson. And I did ask him, I said, why do you suppose your grandfather hit us? And he just said, you were cute little girls, and he couldn't see you turned <laughs> out. <laughs> no. Little girls who, a little girl who liked to dance on tables, right? right? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> We'll never know. We'll, we'll never know. Never but, know. but I know that uh, this was lives. one of the reasons. They were good yeah. neighbors, good people. Yeah. So then let's move to after the, after the war, after you're in hiding. Um, how did you ended up in very different places before you ended up together in Greensboro? You know, uh, Rachel, you went to St. Petersburg and you were there during the Cold War. And Shelley, you were in the United States, in Philadelphia, and then in Greensboro, is that right? That's so right. tell us kind of a nutshell about your, how you started life again um, after, after you were in hiding. Well, um, for me, coming to the United States was very strange. Um, you know, I had never ridden in a car. I had never seen television, and yet, I walked into my aunt's house and there was a television set and I sat down and watched it. Um, I didn't, you know, 
have a telephone. I, I was afraid of the telephone. Can you imagine that? I was really afraid to talk on the telephone. Um, it was a lot of adjustment. I didn't speak English. I was put, I was the only immigrant put in my school and um, I looked different. And, you know, for the first six months, I just kind of sat there. And, uh, you know, I found some, some kids were very nice. And I guess I don't remember the ones that were mean to me. And you were about, <laughs> and you were about 12, is that I right? I was 12, yes. For me, um, at, that, at the time we lived in Ukraine, um, right after the war, uh, yes, I had to go to school, but I was, I think, nine years old, too old for the first grade. Um, but I, I did go, and... Um, Oh, I remember that I had a lot of uh, girlfriends, Polish girlfriends, and Ukrainians. Um, school was school, you know, nothing exceptional, but uh, I, <laughs> especially after the war when there were no, no teachers, <laughs> good teachers. Um, so, uh, just uh, everyday life. You told me about um, a story about anti-Semitism that you experienced in uh, yes. St. Petersburg. I, I, uh, there weren't, uh, I even don't know if there were any Jews in my school. I think maybe two or three. Or maybe I, I was even the only one. And of course, yes, there, there was a lot of anti-Semitism. And I was always afraid that I might be beaten by the boys or even the girls. Um, I had to kind of uh, be very careful what I say, what I do how I look, all this was very important at the time. Because um, they were children of Ukrainian nationalist families. Children of Ukrainian police that was helping the Germans. And you, you could imagine what they heard at home about the Jews um, uh, and about the, the war and all this, whatever was happening at the time. So they, they did have a lot of hatred toward the Jews. And then Shelley, you had a very different experience. Well, this was before the war. I, um, we lived next door to my grandfather and he had a well for his water, and his well was poisoned by a um, Ukrainian who was his competitor in business. And everybody got sick, uh, and they, adults were taken and had their stomachs pumped, but I was too little for them to do that, so I, almost died, but Raya's mother saved my life by finding an apple in winter and mixing that with um, charcoal. 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 Charcoal, right. It wasn't like so now. So I remember that very well, I, because everybody was huddling around and thinking I was dying. And it wasn't like now when you could Google or a solution, or you could go find an apple any day of the year and Harris Teeter. That was not that case at all. And then, what, and then after the war, you said it was very different, your, your experience versus Rachel's experience. Right. Well, when I was in the DP camps, I do remember, it was the first time I had friends and we were free to run around, but there was, we were living in Jeremy Army 
barracks, you know. And there was um, a fence around our camp, and we would go to the fence, and there would be some German kids, boys mostly, calling us dirty Jews and throwing rocks at us. So I'm assuming they had heard that at home, too. But it, it wasn't anything we didn't expect. Um, and so now, moving it to, to now, and as you look out in this audience of students, um, what's most important? What is, the, what is the message after all that you've experienced in your lives? And, and I think, Shelley, when we talked on the phone, you said um, that life has a funny way of working. You know? um, so what, when you look at all the funny ways that your lives have worked um, and all the, the, the good and the very bad, what is the message that you want to share? And what's the advice that you have for students? Well... My advice is, well, you know, I think it was Ilya Wiesel that said that, that it was the good people that allowed the Holocaust to happen. And uh, I, I feel very, very strongly <clears throat> that we have a responsibility to make sure when we see things happening that aren't right to speak up. That is the most important thing. And that we need to, I know that we can't all be like Mother Teresa or Gandhi or something, but we can affect the people around us. We can state our opinions of what is good and what is evil. And therefore, I think that it's important, our responsibility to take that on and I think the world would be a much better place if we respected each other and appreciated our differences. Well, uh, I have the same opinion. I think uh, I have the same thoughts as Shelley does, so I, I joined that Stand up. Uh, statement. And you're here today because of the willingness of a family right. to stand up and because, yes, because we want people to know what was happening and we don't want a repeat of that. So now we're going to turn it on over to all of you to ask questions. Um, we, there is a microphone right here in this aisle and we ask that you, anyone is welcome to ask a question, but if you would please, a couple of ground rules. One, be, practice the art of conciseness and brevity, um, so there's room for other people to ask questions. Two, please introduce yourselves, and three, please use the microphone. So we'll open the floor for questions. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rachel also. I'm from Philadelphia, and I grew up in a very um, highly populated Jewish area don't know if I said that right, but um, I was just wondering what brought you down to North Carolina because I did feel that sense of Jewish community in Philadelphia and I didn't know if you found one down here. Well, we came in 1972 and it was a choice. Um, I had three little girls and I, you know, it had and Greensboro had a Jewish day school, and it was important for me to educate my children and know who they were. So that's why we chose Greensboro. And it was a, a much quieter way of life. At, you know, it was just a, a simpler way of life than the big city. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Another question? Hi, I'm Owen. Uh, Rachel, you talked a bit about your time after the war and uh, kind of going back to school. Uh, could you talk about uh, what happened when you made the transfer from uh, the USSR to America in uh, 1980? Well, um, 
it's completely different. Uh, Russia was a, um, under the Iron Curtain for a long time, a closed, very closed in society, socialistic society. Uh, we, I grew up without religion. Um, even though education was very important, uh, whoever wanted to get education could, could get it. Um, we weren't free to travel to uh, other countries. Um, there were a lot of restrictions, and when we came to America, it was a free world. We couldn't believe that we can do anything we want to. <laughs> so it, it was completely different, a different life. But we adjusted real well and fast. What's one, what's one freedom that you found to be astounding that you hadn't had before? Oh. Groceries. Huh? <laughs> yeah, um, not, not really. Somebody said the grocery store. <laughs> when I went to oh. Russia, you had to stand in line for, for everything. Potatoes, bread. Uh, uh, we went to see the ballet, and, which was wonderful, and she went out and stood in line for bananas for her son because they were so rare and missed half the performance. Yeah, that's true. Food, <laughs> <laughs> food was scarce in, in Russia, especially in the 1980s. Uh, and after we left, it was even worse. So yeah, that was a shock. That, Everything was available here. Anything you wanted to buy, you could buy. <laughs> and if you have money. <laughs> With money. Yeah, that was a big... Not only food, uh, everything else. You couldn't buy a car there. You couldn't... Clothing was scarce. Everything was kind of... Um, always lines in the stores. Always... Uh, a rarity if, if, if it was something nice. Shoes were very difficult to buy. It, it wasn't easy, yeah. I forgot all about it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Another question? Hi, I'm Kyle. I just want to say thank you again for coming. It's such a pleasure to have you here. Um, I understand that you guys, when you were hiding, were unaware of why you were being persecuted, um, but clearly found out later. Can you speak a little bit to how finding out that your Jewish heritage was why you are being persecuted impacted your faith and your relationship with the Jewish community? Um, well, I don't know about my faith, but when I was a teen, I read almost everything I could about the Holocaust because I was trying to understand it. I was trying to understand how human beings could do that to other human beings and came to the conclusion that there was no answer. And, you know, like I said earlier, all we can do with our lives is affect the people around us to a degree. As far as religion went, my parents were educated in their religion and they were observant and they felt comfortable with it. So I just followed along with them. And I don't think it had anything to do. I mean, I've always been proud of being Jewish, yeah. Well, being in Russia, I grew up without any religion, no religion there, um, especially in the Soviet, Soviet Russia. 
Um, so I didn't know about religion, and I didn't know about the Holocaust. You wouldn't believe it, but we were not taught, we were not told, we had no idea what was happening in Europe, being in Russia. Um, I only found out really about the Holocaust here in America that all the European Jewry was killed. I found out here by reading books, by, by uh, listening to people, what was going on during the war with the Jews um, in Russia. Never, ever have I heard the word about these massive killings, um, about the Holocaust, no. There was no topic about it. Nobody talked about it. I believe people knew about it, but they never did uh, talk about it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Another question? My name's Maria, thank you for coming. Um, in between the time where you guys found out about the Holocaust and when you were hiding, how did you guys rationalize being um, cooped up for so long? I can't understand. How did you rationalize being cooped up for so long? I mean, after the, after the end of the war, after when the they took me No, while, of while it? you guys were um, hiding. While? Yeah, while you were hiding, how did you guys kind of uh, I don't think we, we rationalized it at the time. We were too young for that. Um, after the war, you know, after we... It's a difficult question to think about because we were living day to day. We worried about our water, our food, you know, the basics, being cold, the rats and the mice drove me crazy, you know. The basic daily necessities were very important to survive. That was the ration. Um, nothing, nothing else. Plus, we didn't know a whole lot because we were children, and the wills to survive, that, that was the most important in our lives at that time. That's a very strong theme, the will to survive, and the intuition that fueled it, fueled, made it possible. Thank you. Thank you. Another question? Trish. Hi, I'm Trisha. Um, I was just wondering, first off, were your mom's sisters, or were they, how were they related? And second, why didn't they stick together after the war? Yeah, they were sisters. Uh, and what, what about after the war? Um, well, you stayed in the Ukraine, yeah, and then you um, came here, so. My mother was harassed by the communists. She didn't like what was going on, and uh, she felt she wanted to leave the communists. Oh. Well, my mother stayed behind. I mean, we, li we, we remained in the Soviet Union. There was a reason for my mother to stay there because she met a man that she wanted to marry and um, he could not leave and go to Poland or, or, or Germany. So she, she, she stayed in Soviet Russia, Ukraine, actually. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, we'll, we'll get both. You, you'll be our last question, Dan, okay? I'm just curious. Uh, my name is John. And thank you so much for sharing your story with us. I'm just curious. You've shared so much of your story uh, from your own memory and your own experiences, and you experienced it as children. Your mother's experienced it as adults, and I'm wondering, did, did they talk with you about their thoughts or feelings, or was it something that did they share their memories of, of that experience with you at all, or was it something that was never talked about after? Not really. No, not really. No, mm -mm. no. They, they never talked to us about they did it. did not want to talk about it. I do know my mother would, had guilt that she survived, and her sisters and brothers and family did not. Did, did she say and that's she, very common with Holocaust survivors. Did she talk about? Did she say that, or did you just did you pick she that up? She did not like to talk about it. No. Yes. No. So didn't my mother. No, she never told me anything about. And they would the, talk about. My mother would talk about her childhood some, but that was before the war. Oh, it's the same. The same with my mother. Really? Mm -hmm. Okay. She remembered all her childhood. She was telling me stories. Uh, about her family, her brothers, her father, mother, but never about the Holocaust. Hi, I'm, I'm Dan. I just wanted to thank you guys for coming here today. Um, and Shelley, I, after you read, you know, your statement about um, what, you know, happened, and you were talking about the, you know, the, the pits where, you know, everyone was being, you know, I'm shot here, and dropped into it. Just how did you, you know, Come you here. said you, we, out and speak up. I sorry. Can't we can't hear a word. I don't know how much of that you heard. If you want me to repeat. Maybe redo, do, redo it. <laughs> sorry. I'm, I'm Dan. I just wanted to thank you guys for, for coming here. Okay. Um, and, you know, you guys were, Shelly, we were talking about how there were pits, you know, where, you know, Jews were being shot and dropped into. And, I was wondering, you know, you said you passed out, and, you know, what happened during that day? I guess that you can remember. That's a very, you know, it was a really what, gruesome thing that you guys were talking about. What happened on the day of the massacre? What happened with, with them, you mean? Yeah. With where us? Were, where were you? Yeah. yeah. Like, how did you survive, I guess, yeah. with that? Yeah. Did you oh, so they... Uh, yeah. No, I mean, sorry, I didn't mean like what? that. What? Just... I didn't get... So, where, so on the day of the massacre, you weren't there, but what, where were you on that day? Oh, yeah. we were at the farm. My mother took, my mother, we were, had been in a, in a ghetto, and my mother would go out to work. This is what she told me, okay? And that one of her Polish neighbors told her there was gonna be the massacre. And so she snuck us out of the ghetto so and your, we went so to the farm. So your mother was running on just a hunch. And uh, it was a hunch. Yeah. Yeah. It was a hunch. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Sin, do we have time for one more? Since she's talking, I'm going to say we have time for one more question. Okay. Um, is there one more question? The, one, the final one? Sure. I'm LD, and I'm very grateful that you're here. In your time in the U.S., have there been times when you feel like, as a nation, we perhaps have learned lessons about the Holocaust, maybe better than other times? Are there, are there times that you ever worry about where, where we're headed as a nation? Yes, I do. And... Um, I worry about it a lot. And I worry about the world because massacres are going on today in all different parts of the world. And it doesn't seem, I mean, look at Syria. What are we doing? We're talking a lot and, you know, we're going to bomb some planes. Um, no, I don't think people have learned the lesson of the Holocaust. I really don't. And I, I think, you know, our little part in talking to schools mainly, you know, younger children, not college students, mm -hmm. is to hopefully put those thoughts into their heads that they, they have responsibilities to do about 
something about this world if it's going to, you know, be a, a good place to live. But I, I always think that if situations are right and you get a leader that can, you know, persuade you, it could happen. Look, the Germans were the, the most modern nation in Europe at the time. And that's why I said earlier, I really tried to understand how, you know, how that could happen. Same opinion. Thank you. Yeah. And so I just want to close with, you also talked about, a compliment to that question is, you talked a lot about the will to survive. And my feeling is, to have a will to survive, you have to have hope, right? You have to have some shred of optimism to get up every morning and know you're going to have the same day to day to day. What, what hope do you hold on to? As, and what hope would you share with, with the students who are here? You mean now? Now that you've learned, I that mean, you've held it, on to. It, it's going to sound, you know, uh, sugar sweet, but... We'll take it. <laughs> okay. But I do, I do believe in the goodness of, of human nature. And um, that's the hope that I have, because as much as what we experience and what happened, I have experienced a lot of goodness in this world and a lot of kindness and people who do things where they don't get something out of it, you know, just out of to be a, a good person and to help someone in need. So I do, I have always been more optimistic about the world, although I do worry. Sure, sure. What about you, Rachel? Yeah. Um. Yeah, I, uh, I think that um, the world now is changing. Um, there is a lot of danger. Look what happened in Charlottesville. Um, people have to be very vigilant. And try their best to prevent not to have another Holocaust. And, and what do you hold on to for hope? What's the hope that made it possible? What was the hope in the will to survive that you hold, that you maybe are still holding on to and you would want to share? Any, is, what would you share with these students in terms of hope, a hope that you have? Well, I hope that especially the younger generation um, will learn a lot uh, of what is happening in the world and try to prevent in the future and, and now of any any uh, holocaust or any any bad things that could happen in the world yeah and as you both said that starts with being good to each other right yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. um so that starts and continues with being good to each other so I want to thank you both for being good with us <laughs> and, and um, sharing your time and sharing your story and sharing your film with us. It's such an honor. Thank you.